What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. I'm Nicholas. This is BDGE Fantasy Football. Big dogs got to eat. And today we are wrapping up our running back rankings video. Last week we did one through six. So if you missed that, go check it out. I'll link it somewhere up here as well as in the description. Make sure you pop over and watch that either before this or after this. I don't really care. A lot of good feedback on this one. So we keep trekking along ranking seven through 12 if y'all enjoy the video at any time all i request i demand of you is just a little little tap on that thumbs up button if you're new to the channel and you want some good fancy football advice for the rest of the summer you can subscribe to the channel i'm done talking i've had a massive massive cup of coffee already today i'm ready to roll i'm actually gonna go fill up another cup and then we'll do the video <laughs> I think I'm lying out here. See the steam, baby. Literally nobody drinks more caffeine than me. I'm not proud of that. It's a big flaw of mine. As always, want to take a second to thank the iTunes listeners for leaving a rating and review. This is from Arm221. <laughs> the information Nick provides in his podcast is amazing. He plays from both sides of the political spectrum to give a fair and balanced report of current events. I love his piece on the exploitation of the modern upper middle class worker who knew that 18th century interpretations could be applied to 21st century socioeconomic analysis. Thank you for the content, Nick. Thank you for being a post-political Marxist arm 221. I love you. Go leave a rating and review if you're on iTunes. I'm sorry. I don't know what the fuck that was. I just screenshotted the first review that I saw. Happened to be that one. It was five stars. It got me excited. I have no idea what the fuck he's talking about, but let's get into the running backs. Honestly, for as energetic as, as I sound right now, I'm in a pretty, pretty shitty mood. I'm filming this at like 9 30 six in the morning crack of dawn and now i'm yawning and eight minutes ago not eight minutes ago a report came out that the eagles are interested in carlos hyde and that makes me angry that that really fucking grinds my gears because i wrote this blog post like a week or two ago and i decided that miles sanders was going to be my rb7 this year in fantasy they didn't sign anybody but they are supposedly interested in signing a veteran running back which is not good news for a doug peterson type offense now i want to go through miles sanders because this was my analysis prior to them signing anybody prior to any of these reports or rumors coming out and i still am high on miles sanders but this does have to make you skeptical a little bit so when i do these lists right the top 10 or top 12 fantasy running backs like every player on the list is extremely talented obviously so my job is to decide whether or not i like a guy whether you should be targeting him whether you should be staying away and then play the opposite side play the devil's advocate and poke holes in those arguments that are arguing against me we got fucking inception inside inception inside analysis so we find the holes and we fill them we're like johnny sins with the dick for Miles Sanders as the RB7, until they sign a veteran, the biggest argument against him, of course, was that Doug Peterson, their head coach, has always used a running back by committee, and that is a, that is a big fact. Last year, Miles' 179 carries was the most of a running back in a Doug Peterson-led offense. Our job is not to tell you that he uses running back by committee. We fucking already know that. Our job is to figure out whether or not he will do it again in 2020, and if so, to what extent. The next part of this was me talking about how Jordan Howard going over to Miami is absolutely massive for Miles Sanders' upside, and it will hurt if they sign a veteran such as Carlos Hyde. Ain't gonna lie there, but we're gonna act as if they didn't sign anybody yet for now. When they do, we could change the tune and we'll do a re-fucking analysis. We'll do a re-post of this and re analyze all this shit. So you look at the depth chart as of today. It's Miles Sanders, it's Boston Scott, it's fucking Corey Clement, and then two guys who are battling to see who is slower in undrafted free agent Michael Warren and Elijah Holyfield. I don't even know if Holyfield's on the roster. For Clement, they didn't tender him. They let him walk. He went out in free agency, and everyone was like, no, you're not an NFL caliber running back. We're not signing you. So the Eagles, familiarity with the system, whatever, gave him a small one-year contract to come back to them. If you think Clement in any way was going to impact Miles Sanders' workload, you're drunk. As of right now, it's literally just Miles Sanders and Boston Scott. So is Boston Scott going to be involved in the offense? Sure. Let's take a look back at last year. Obviously, Sanders, during his rookie year, was stuck behind Jordan Howard for the first half of the season. We're all sitting here salivating over a fucking Sanders workload boner. It doesn't happen until Jordan Howard actually gets hurt in like week nine. And then they have their bye week 10. Starting in week 11, Howard's first game that he was not on the field for, 
Sanders is getting nearly 21 opportunities a game, carries plus targets over the remainder of the season. That was while Boston Scott was there. So Boston Scott's this like twitchy, freaky little athlete with really good work in the passing game. And we saw that come to fruition over the last four weeks of the season. He was extremely involved and he looked great. In those four games, Scott saw six, seven, six, and four targets. But that didn't take away from Sanders' workload. In those same games where Scott saw six, seven, six, and four, Sanders saw five, six, six, and five. And that was including week 17 where he left with an ankle sprain. It's not one or the other when it comes to Scott or Sanders. They could both be very involved in the passing game. Sanders is a very good pass catching back and he showed that while Scott was there on the field it wasn't like he was doing this in week 11 12 13 when Scott wasn't playing if you look at the actual raw numbers weeks 14 15 and 16 again Sanders left week 17 with an ankle injury so we discounted that but the per game numbers Scott saw 6.3 targets Miles Sanders 5.7 receptions five still for Miles Sanders 6.3 for Scott Miles Sanders tops him in receiving yards per game, 50.3 compared to just 38.3 for Boston Scott. Sanders got in the end zone while Scott did not. It's not mutually exclusive that Sanders can be very good and involved in the passing game while Boston Scott makes this a small running back by committee. And then you look at their wild card playoff game where Miles Sanders out-targeted Scott 5-3. to three. I don't think people really understand how good Miles Sanders was in his rookie year. He led all rookies in yards from scrimmage, 13-27, 63 targets, 50 receptions, while playing on 52% of the team's snaps. He did that he put those numbers up while he was in a committee as a rookie Sanders is going to be the guy I don't care what veteran they sign you want to talk about them signing Carlos Hyde Carlos Hyde sure he actually had a very surprisingly good season in Houston that's amazing I'm getting on a call with a doctor on, on Thursday, and it's my first time visiting this doctor. I just got a text across the screen. That's why. They texted a reminder saying, you know, you have your, your doctor's appointment Thursday at 1.20 or whatever. We're going to do it like via Skype. And <laughs> the lady who I was talking to on the phone to make the appointment was like Spanish, and it was kind of hard to understand her. And I'm sure she had trouble understanding me too, even though I speak beautiful beautiful crispy clear. I should have plugged my microphone into my phone to make that phone call. She put my first name in as meth Urkelano. So not Nick, but meth. Legit. M-E-T-H. That's incredible. Think about changing my YouTube channel name to meth Urkelano. Anyways, Sanders is going to be the guy in 2020. This Philadelphia Eagles offensive line ranked number one in run blocking last year. They're still going to be very, 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 very good in opening up holes for whoever's there, right? Jordan Howard was like 25 years old, still in his prime. Carlos Hyde, He's going to be 30 years old by the time the season starts. So you tell me who's more of a danger, who's more of a workload threat to Miles Sanders. How big is the committee between Carlos Hyde and Miles Sanders? If that happens, if they sign a vet, that remains to be seen. But I would assume that Miles Sanders gets a decent portion of the goal line carries there. Jordan Howard last year had eight goal line carries in the first eight games. Obviously, that paces out to 16 over 16, which would have been like top three in the NFL in terms of just goal, raw goal line carries for running backs. Once Sanders took over last year as the guy, once Jordan Howard went down, Sanders was legitimately a top five fantasy running back, like top three in PPR. The numbers via Vegas, and got, I had a lot of people ask me where I got these numbers from. If you just go type in FanDuel Sportsbook or, or DraftKings Sportsbook, on there they have different player props listed. So for Miles Sanders' 2020 regular season, total rushing plus receiving yards, they have him pegged at a 1,500 yard over under, which is like 10 yards fewer than they have Derrick Henry at. So that should tell you something. I don't think Jordan Howard coming in, I mean, uh, Carlos Hyde coming in is going to drastic affect that. Obviously, I will have to re-examine the situation and probably move them down a couple notches if they do bring in a veteran, veteran running back because, again, Peterson is a big running back by committee guy, and that will probably be the case if they do bring in some kind of fucking bruiser, which is really unfortunate because I was all in on going, you know, getting Miles Sanders at the back at the back end of the first round, early second round, if possible. His current ADP right now is actually crept up really, really, really early. He's currently the 110 RB8 off the board, so people are getting a little bit sharp, and those who took him that early are probably a little bit nervous with that Carlos Hyde report. So until anything changes, it's Miles Sanders as my RB7, which leaves a fan favorite, Joe Mixon, as my running back eight. He is currently off the board at 109, running back seven. The argument for Mixon is, is a very simple one. He's extremely talented, extremely athletic. He has the size, the speed, the three down ability. Now we got bike to bike, 1400 yard seasons on the resume. The offense should be incredibly improved this year with a new quarterback, Joe Burrow, a much more capable quarterback under center. And they're getting their first round pick from last year, 2019, Jonah Williams back at left tackle after missing his entire rookie year, which should be a huge, massive upgrade to that offensive line. So why do I have him at number eight. 
Well, I ask you, what the fuck is going on in the passing game there in Cincinnati? Are we just projecting that after three seasons of him being completely underwhelming in the passing game, that just because you want it to happen, he's going to get all this passing work? He's been like a two to three target per game guy in his career through three years so far. It's almost his entire rookie contract. And now we're just expecting that number to go up to five to six targets a game. Again, I like Mixon. He's my number eight running back. But I, I understand when I do analysis like this, if he's not as high as the consensus likes him to be, if he's not like the number six running back, I have to argue why I don't have him at number six. So I poke the holes in. It doesn't mean I don't like Mixon. It's not a guy that I'm avoiding. So when you hear my tone arguing for or against guys, that doesn't mean that I'm avoiding them. Wait till I actually have fucking videos where I'm like players to avoid. Then you know I want to avoid those guys. Joe Mixon is not a guy I'm looking to avoid. I'm just nervous about the passing game. It's just a very, very, very big question mark because you look at 2019 and 2018. He played two more games in 2019. So he played the full 16 this previous year. The year prior in 2018, he played 14 games. So he played two fewer games. He had 10 more targets in 2018 than he did in 2019. So how does that happen, man? I mean, Mixon had two more targets than Gio Bernard did last year. If Gio gets cut, then yeah, maybe we're looking at a different outlook. But until then, Gio is still very, very much involved in the passing game. He's still very, very much involved on third down. In those two minute and four minute offenses, it's not Mixon on the field. So why is he going to get more passing work this year? Because you want him to? Like, th th that ain't it. Overall, Mixon played on 59% of the team snaps. That is not a big number for an RB1. Gio played on the other 40% pretty much so again talk about the two minute and four minute drills where running backs get targeted pretty heavily that's mainly geo Mixon does mix in a little he, he mixes in he mix sons in a little bit but geo is that guy and i know i know oh because joe burrow's in there and he loves to pass to the running back right look what clyde edwards did last year in that lsu offense 55 receptions the raw numbers look great sure but in terms of the actual offense itself burrow threw the ball a shit ton jamar chase caught a ton of balls justin jefferson caught a ton of balls their tight ends were very good so when you look at the raw reception numbers yes ceh had 55 receptions which is is very impressive but of the overall market share which is more telling it's more relevant to you know how successful they actually were in the passing game or how dominant they were that 55 reception number was not elite and you go back to 2018 Burrow barely threw to his running backs. So you could say that like, yes, Burrow's coming in and he's going to throw the running backs more, but then wouldn't that have been a constant theme regardless of the offensive scheme? Like you can't, you can't make the arguments both ways. You can't just, because you want Mixon to have more involvement in the passing game, you can't say, okay, it's the scheme. Okay. It's the quarterback. And then when you go with the other option and you're like, oh, he didn't throw the running back in 2018, then you say, oh, it was a different scheme. Okay. So it's one or the other though. I'm also way more of the mindset that that was a Joe Brady thing than a Joe Burrow thing. A couple Joe B's out here, both great guys, but I think Brady was the scheme guy. He's the one who had all these plays to the running back. Again, don't get me wrong. Mixon was an absolute beast last year. The second half of the year, he was literally like on pace for 390 touches. I'm pretty sure their game plan, because they had backup quarterbacks in and shit, were just like, don't get anyone killed and just let Mixon carry the ball and carry it and carry it and carry it and don't throw the ball whatsoever. If you look at the, the second half of the season, he saw 23 touches in six of their final eight games, which is incredible. And he had at least 26 touches in half of those games. So for the eight games, he had at least 26 touches. You don't see that type of workload in the NFL these days with these running backs and the committees that we normally see. So do we do we see that with a capable quarterback under center? I'm not sure. Does Burrow get more passing attempts and do they not lean on Mixon as much? Could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. I don't know. Mixon was phenomenal on the ground last year though. He led the NFL in evaded tackles, fourth most created yards per touch, but for whatever reason, they won't let him play the workhorse role. And that is where you need to be a little bit weary. So while I like Mixon, his range of outcomes could be another like heavy ground year while disappointing in the passing game. If he's only getting, you know, 30 to 35 receptions, is he really that much better than all these other guys in that, that have question marks in the passing game? I don't know. I'm also not going to talk about a possible holdout here. We'll We'll cross that bridge when it comes. I don't think Mixon ends up holding out or missing any time this year. I know the the main argument for Mixon is like, this offense is going to be so much better and so much more improved. Guys, Vegas still has them pegged as the single lowest win total. Five and a half games. That is tied for dead last in the NFL. So yes, things are exciting. I'd be excited if I was a Bengals fan. But 2020, they're not going to be a fucking playoff team. Numero nine. Okay, so I'll just come right out with it. It's Josh Jacobs. And I was so ready to put him as my RB7, if not compete with Derrick Henry as my RB6, because I really liked what they were saying about him getting him more involved in the passing game. But they have done everything to the contrary of what they're saying. Listen, I'm in life, you know, it's a very big cliche. It's actions speak louder than words. When you go out and sign 17 pass catching running backs, that tells you something. I was really excited to see them let Jacobs catch a ton of passes. That was his big, big knock during his rookie year. 
other than he's never seen a full workload and can't hold up over a full season, <clears throat> that was that was the, the problem, the pass catching work. Guy was a beast, though, on the ground. While Sanders did lead all rookies, Josh Jacobs was right behind him, over 1,300 yards from scrimmage, which, yes, if you do the math based on 13 games that he played in, is over 100 yards from scrimmage per game. He had five separate games of over 100 rushing yards. That's tied with guys like Dalvin Cook and Aaron Jones. He ranked top 10 yards per carry, 4.75, and yards after contact, 3.48. The guy could not be denied on the ground. And the craziest thing, per some PFF numbers, he led all running backs in missed tackles forced, despite missing three games. Total missed tackles forced. Josh Jacobs led the NFL. I know I said Joe Mixon led the NFL in evaded tackles. That is per player profiler. So I believe missed tackles forced, evaded tackles are two different in terms of the way they made their tackles miss that makes any sense like one is by elusiveness one is by power speed elusiveness regardless both are very 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 fucking good on the ground and another part of this offensive philosophy here in Oakland that I think is super underrated is that their offensive line is really really good they were number six overall in run blocking per football outsiders they did improve per PFF their rating was a little bit lower but overall they're going in the right direction there so again the problem comes in on the passing side of things the guy caught just 20 passes last year so we're thinking okay Jalen Richard free agent let him go DeAndre Washington free agent let him go D wash is gone he signed in KC I don't imagine he'll be there for long. Jacob Stonks fucking through the roof. Not so fast. Let's re-sign Jalen Richard for two more years. Okay, maybe just a depth play. The guy knows the playbook. He's been here for a long time. Hard worker, no big deal. Jacob's passing work, still in business. The NFL draft comes. They go with Henry Ruggs, 12th overall. They draft Brian Edwards and Lynn Bowden in the third round. Okay, let's start convincing ourselves, cool, this will open up the offense more. Definitely not going to affect Jacobs' passing game work, right? I think the worst piece of fantasy analysis I ever see is just the fact that when like a team adds a wide receiver, people just say, oh, it's going to stretch the field for the running back. I, there's nothing that pisses me off more than that piece of analysis because Derek Carr and Ma Marcus Mariota are are the premier field-stretching quarterbacks that you need in fantasy football. Okay, in all seriousness, Jalen Richard, just a depth play. These wide receivers getting drafted, going to stretch the field for Jacobs. But hold on. One of these wide receivers officially announced as a running back. That is Lynn Bowden Jr. out of Kentucky. He led the entire SEC conference. Most people don't know this. He led the entire SEC conference in rushing last year. He's also a wide receiver, a pass catching guy. So when the Raiders insist that Josh Jacobs in the backfield is going to get more passing work, but you re-sign Jalen Richard, you bring in a guy who led the SEC in rushing, who is naturally a wide receiver. He was actually playing quarterback last year because their quarterback got hurt and they ran a lot of Wildcats. So that's why he led the SEC in rushing. But he is a wide receiver first. So you look at Richard, you look at Lim Bowden. On top of those extra weapons, you have Henry Ruggs, who I don't think a lot of people understand how they're going to use Henry Ruggs. Henry Ruggs is extremely, extremely fast. He's going to be one of the fastest guys in the NFL right from the rip. But he's not... He's not like a, a Mike Evans type guy where it's bad comparison from the speed, but in terms of like the play style, the way they're going to use him, they're not going to be throwing it deep to Henry Ruggs. Sure, they will have some deep attempts down there, but he's not like Deshaun Jackson. He's a guy who prospers by the line of scrimmage, giving him a lot of screens, giving him a lot of like slants over the middle where they get the ball in his hands very quickly and let him make plays afterwards. So that's more targets by the line of scrimmage that aren't going to Josh Jacobs. So we have Jalen Richard, Lynn Bowden out of the backfield. We have Henry Ruggs added. We have Brian Edwards. We have Tyrell Williams, we have Darren Waller, we have Hunter Renfro. All are supposed to be major breakout candidates, but Josh Jacobs still going to get 75 targets, right? They went out and signed Devontae Booker. Devontae Booker is terrible. I don't even know if he'll make the roster realistically, but he's like Javorius Allen. He's like LaMichael P. Ryan, where he is the definition of catch the ball and fall. But that's what he does best. He catches the ball. So they add th they have three running backs outside of Josh Jacobs, all who bring their best asset to the field as a pass catcher. So all in all, Jacobs should ball on the ground, but I just can't reasonably put him in the top echelon of running backs because everything they're doing is contradicting everything they're saying and that makes me nervous man if they start i don't know if they cut Devonte booker and maybe i just can't see how jacobs improves greatly over the numbers that he that he put up last year so we move on to number 10 i'll let you know we're only going up to 12 today but you have the ability to get my top 20 running back rankings absolutely free i'm not here to plug or sell you anything we're working on something very cool behind the scenes that i think you guys are, are really 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 going to enjoy and again it's it's not you know i'm not selling you anything here you don't have to pay for shit but it's something i'm super excited about so i wanted to share with you a little bit more to get the top 20 running back rankings there will be a link right down below in the description it'll probably be the first thing in there it says get the first fucking 20 running back rankings from big dog you gotta eat you click that it'll take you to a page you just throw your email in and uh it'll pop up you'll get the running back rankings i'll put that in the comments as well whenever i wake up 
today. So when you do that, it'll sign you up for our email list, but I promise we're not gonna be like fucking spamming you and annoying the shit out of you with anything. What we're doing with the email list, believe it or not, Snacks is actually a very good writer. He is ridiculous on camera and he's incredibly ugly. I'm just kidding, he's not ugly. But the, the point being here is he's a very good writer. So we are developing a newsletter, a weekly newsletter that in a sense is almost going to be like a video vlog version in a written form. And it's gonna be fucking really cool and I'm really excited to get it out to you guys. Within the newsletter, which is gonna come out every Monday morning, we're gonna have a bunch of different sections. One of the sections is gonna be like the best things that we saw on Twitter. So if we saw a bunch of really cool fantasy things on Twitter that we think are worth sharing with you guys, we'll put that in the email. One of the sections is going to be the best pieces of content that we've as a team, as a big dogs team personally consumed via podcast, via written articles, via videos, whatever it is. We're going to give you our favorite, our top three pieces of content that we consumed the previous week. We're going to have a section all about the brand where we're writing up some paragraphs about what's going on with the brand behind the scenes, you know, building out the headquarters and hiring interns and shit. So it's very much like a vlog lifestyle type of newsletter, which I'm really excited to get out. Again, it's every single Monday in your inbox. If you go down below and sign up for for the top 20 running back rankings that will automatically take care of the rest and you'll be signed up for the newsletter as well you can also just get the top 20 running back rankings and then unsubscribe like an asshole if you want to but i suggest you stick around at least for the first one because that will go out in six days and let us know what you think about it so number 10 we're starting to see a theme here right basically starting at number six probably without miles sanders but the theme here is all these running backs in the back half of the first early second round what is their receiving work going to be like they all have questionable third down roles, which brings us to Nick Chubb at number 10. On top of what we already presented, right? Mixon is is battling with Gio. Jacobs is fighting with Jalen Richard and some other unproven players, whatever, whatever. Nick Chubb is sharing the backfield with a guy who came into the NFL during his rookie season, won the rushing title, scored 11 touchdowns and caught 53 passes. We all love Nick Chubb. We all think Nick Chubb is in incredibly talented. And if he ends up being like the fucking RB1, I don't think anyone would be surprised. But you cannot not just forego the fact that Kareem Hunt, who we've seen play at an elite level in the NFL, is sharing the backfield with Nick Chubb. I would almost say that as long as Kareem Hunt is in this backfield, there is a 0% chance that Nick Chubb's ceiling is realized. Does that mean Nick Chubb cannot be very good for fantasy? Absolutely not. His floor is fantastic. And I asked this question on Twitter about a month ago. Make sure you're following me on Twitter if you're not already, at Nick underscore BDGE. I said, are these running back numbers worthy of a first round fantasy pick? 288 cash carries, 22 receptions, so 310 overall touches, 1,626 yards from scrimmage, 22 goal line carries. I asked that, and everyone was pretty much, yeah, like back end first round pick. So what those numbers are, Chubb's 16 game pace with Kareem Hunt on the field for the final eight. So I discounted the first eight weeks of last season where Nick Chubb was getting all the touches, and I looked at the final eight games of last year when Kareem Hunt was on the field with Nick Chubb and then extrapolated it out to 16 games to get a better, more clear picture of what was going on with Nick Chubb's workload. So the two played eight games together, and that still put Nick Chubb on pace for 310 touches and a buttload of goal line carries. I will say though, a lot of that, a lot of the goal line numbers had to do with the fact that Nick Chubb just couldn't get in the goddamn end zone and they just kept giving him goal line carries. So it was like three or four at a time, which boosted his numbers. So I don't want to like double count those. So I wouldn't read too much, too, 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 too much into those. That being said though, Chubb had like the worst goal line to touchdown ratio, like conversion, just converting goal line carries into touchdowns. He was really bad. Like think of the worst running back in the NFL doing that. And Nick Chubb was worse. Last year, he had 15 goal line carries. And by goal line, I mean inside the five-yard line. You could find these numbers on Pro Football Reference. Inside the five-yard line, goal line carries. Nick Chubb had 15. He turned two of them into touchdowns. On those 15 carries on the goal line, he literally produced that into negative 14 yards. So 15 carries for negative 14 yards, two of them being touchdowns on the goal line. But the Browns massively upgraded their offensive line, which is where we need to get excited. They bring in the former Titans right tackle, Jack Conklin, top five graded run blocking tackle in the NFL last year per PFF. He's nowhere near as good in the passing game, but he's very, very, very good in the run game. Then they, of course, use their first round pick on Jedrick Wills Jr., tackle out of Alabama. He's a phenomenal run blocking tackle as well. So a huge piece for them. It'll be interesting to see 
uh, what their plan is for these tackles because both of them played right tackle. I believe Wills was expected to move over to left tackle, but with like shortened training camp, who knows? Maybe they just say, fuck it. We didn't get enough time to prepare him to play left tackle. We'll just move Jack Conklin, the veteran, over to left tackle and see how it goes. So there might be a little bit more than meets the eye when it comes to the offensive line in Cleveland. So we'll have to stay tuned for that. Of course, we also have to touch down Kevin Stefanski coming over as a new head coach. We know he's a run first guy. Both Chubb and Hunt can get a lot of touches. It's not mutually exclusive. Both of them can be very, very, very good. Last year, again, this is a stat that I've brought up 42 times, and I'll bring it up 42 more times this offseason. The Vikings led the NFL in most running back receiving yards from running back screens. So if they decide to use Chubb that way, if they decide to use Chubb in a way that like Derrick Henry is used, where you get him a few screens a game and let him try to get some open space and put a fucking steam behind that head of his, the overall volume might be low, but he could put up some really ridiculous efficiency numbers when it comes to that because of the big plays that might come with Nick Chubb. So with Nick Chubb, we're looking at a new offensive scheme under Stefan an upgraded offensive line we can pretty confidently say that the goal line conversion is going to go up there's a lot to like here but you simply just can't ignore the fact that he's sharing the backfield with Kareem Hunt and he is not a schmuck that's the only concern but the concern is that like you could look at the second half numbers but what happens if Hunt takes even bigger piece of the pie right those are his first games so what happens if Hunt just comes out of the gate playing really really well and that like 65 to 35 touch split turns more into 60 to 40 and then 57 to 43 you know what I mean like that's absolutely in the range of outcomes so you don't want to end up with Chubb as your first round pick and look back and be like fuck like this was so obvious to see coming because he had another really good running back in the committee realistically I don't think he's a good end of first round pick I, I'd much rather and probably would only take him if I do get him in the second round which is possible his ADP right now is the 201 running back 10 off the board I mean listen at the end of the day if Nick Chubb is the RB 10 in fantasy football like the position is is stacked like some goddamn Pringles after RB 10 man things get tricky and this is this is where I'm gonna get a bunch of thumbs down because I don't have your guy listed here there's a tier when I hit 11, there's, there's four guys that I just, it's so fucking hard to decide between who I have at 11 and who I have at 12 compared to 13 and 14. And it seems just like a dart throw. So I'll do my best to give you analysis behind why I picked 11 and 12 the way I did. You look at the four guys that I'm talking about, it's Eckler, it's Kenyon Drake, it's Clyde Edwards Hilaire, and it's Aaron Jones. It's like, how can any of those guys possibly be out of the top 12? It actually hurt my fucking brain thinking about how I was going to rank these guys. So without further ado, at number 11, Kenyon Drake. He is currently going off the board at the 202 RB11, which is way higher than I thought he would be going ADP wise. The only knock really that you can have in Drake at this point is that we've never seen him do it over the course of the season. And, and short term sample sizes, small sample sizes are usually the death of fantasy football players. He had four years at Alabama, never saw more than 106 touches in a season, comes into the NFL three years in Miami, max out at 173 touches. On October 28th of last year, the Dolphins trade Kenyon Drake over to the Cardinals. His first game in this new uniform against a stout 49ers run defense, Drake pops off for 162 total yards, 19 touches. Admittedly, though, for as, as much as people remember Kenyon Drake exploding over the second half of the year, he was pretty wildly inconsistent. He had a few blow up games, but the rest of them were kind of mediocre and brought him down. So he was more of like a boom bust player, a guy whose points per game at the end of the season will be there because he had a bunch of big games, but he wasn't really that consistent on the way there. After that blow up game one against San Fran, his yardage totals over the next month were 41, 80, 51, 67. Then he finished the year strong with a ridiculous four touchdown game against Cleveland, 184, two touchdown game against Seattle, and a, a meh kind of finish against the Rams in the regular season finale. So there was some good, there was some bad, there were some ups, there were some downs. But to be honest with you, this pick for me at RB11 is way more of a situational pick than it is a talent pick. I think Drake is good, but the fact that he's never done it over the course of the season makes me a little nervous. I don't think like Kenyon Drake is that, that special of a running back prospect either. I think he was much better in fantasy than he was real life. And I, you know, I want to back that up with numbers, obviously. So I look at player profiler. Breakaway run rate was 25th. Evaded tackles per attempt was 49th among running backs. Yards created per carry was also 49th among running backs. And that was while he had the fourth best run blocking efficiency in the NFL. That's one of the neat statistics on player profiler, right? Despite the O-line, you think of the Cardinals O-line, you're like, oh, they're a really shitty unit. What player profiler does when they look at the run blocking efficiency, and this is completely free, you can just go on the website and look at it. So their run blocking efficiency metric is the run block rating of the offensive line only when that player was actually running the ball. So they can go to specific players and just running. So look at Drake, he enjoyed the fourth best run blocking efficiency 
in the NFL last year, but he did not create a lot. As you could see, ranked 49th in evaded tackles per attempt, yards created per carry. So again, this is more of a situational thing, not so much a talent thing for me. However, it didn't fucking matter. He was the RB4 in PPR leagues over that span when he was with the Cardinals, right? Once he came to Arizona because of this cliff offense, we see it time and time and time again. Offenses and schemes going into their second year end up prospering. Year one, it's a coin flip. Sometimes it's hit, sometimes it's missed. For the most part, if you're there for a second year, we see a pretty significant statistical jump, at least if you're a good offensive coordinator. And I believe that Cliff as a head coach, obviously, but whose offense is the one that's running in Arizona is going to be good. You just look at the numbers, right? On average, Kenyon Drake had six and a half defenders in the box, which is 53rd in the NFL. They spread this team out, four wide receivers consistently, sometimes five. They spread the box out and there's usually never guys stacking the box against Kenyon Drake runs. So this is an up-tempo offense, which actually massively slowed down over the second half of the year. And they went to become one of the most run heavy teams over the second half of the year. And that's going to be extremely efficient in 2020. This offense as a whole is going to be extremely efficient. I think Kenyon Drake will obviously benefit from that. And you also look at like the backfield, like they paid Kenyon Drake $8 million to be the guy this year. So they're going to use him and they're going to use him a lot. Do they get an extension? I don't know, but that tells me that they might just run him into the ground this year. All they have behind him is Chase Edmonds, who's been like a nice counterpart as a backup guy. And then they take Eno Benjamin in the seventh round. Like, yeah, anyone you could like Eno Benjamin. I'm someone who liked Eno Benjamin. Seventh round draft capital. That ain't it. It's the Kenyon Drake show in 2020. If he can hold up, he's going to eat. Which leads us to running back 12. And I think I already told you guys, it was Clyde Edwards Hilaire of the Kansas City Chiefs, currently going off the board at the 209, running back 14 in drafts. I've talked exhaustedly about CEH over the last two, three, week four, 17 weeks. So if you want to look at my outlook for him in depth, you know, following the NFL draft, I will link some of those videos down below. I, I'm not about to go into another 18 minute spiel. He's just simply going to catch too many passes under Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes, the running backs just get too many scoring opportunities. Said this before, in Mahomes' starts, since he's become a starting quarterback in the NFL, running backs in this offense average 1.74 touchdowns per game. That's all I got to say. You, you believe it's going to be a committee? I mean, I don't know, dude. They just drafted him in the first fucking round, and he's sitting behind the most potent offense in the NFL. So I am not scared whatsoever about Clyde edwards Hilaire playtime and them splitting the backfield him and Damian Williams it's the Clyde show as far as I'm concerned he's going to catch a shitload of passes he's going to experience extremely extremely empty boxes and he's going to score a lot of touchdowns so I love Clyde at the 12 Austin Eckler is right there Aaron Jones would probably be my 14 but again if you want the full 20 the link will be right down below sign up for the newsletter get the top 20 rankings you guys are going to enjoy it please 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 let me know what you think about the newsletter after the first one goes out on May 18th which is a week from when I'm filming this today I love y'all I hope you enjoyed the video if you did make sure you do a little click on the thumbs up button subscribe to the channel if you're new and i will see you on thursday